In the aftermath of the revolution of October 17, the Orthodox monastery of the Solovki Islands in the White Sea is emptied of its monks. This holy place has been chosen to experiment the principles of the Gulag, a locked area far away, isolated and with a harsh weather. Starting in 1923, the Solovki Islands become the first concentration camp where political opponents deemed dangerous by the Bolshevik regime are sent. In June 1923, I disembarked in Solovki. Andrei Rushin is 18 when he reaches the Solovki Islands to serve his sentence. On the boat with me were several political prisoners, Mensheviks, revolutionary socialists and anarchists. There was also a group of clergymen and many common criminals. Alexander Noktev, the first commander of the camp, welcomes the newcomers with these words. You can forget all the rights you once had, for here we have our own rules. Dmitry Likachev is arrested when he's 22 because he belonged to an illegal group of students. When reaching the Solovki Islands, his group is welcomed by the head of the camp like this. Here there's no Soviet power. Here there's Solovkist power. Here the prosecutor never comes. No latecomer will be allowed in the convoy. A step to the left or the right will be deemed an attempt to escape. The Solovki law means that absolute arbitrariness has become the rule. The punishments the watchmen inflict upon the prisoners in this prison are on the edge of sadism. At the center of the circle of hell the Solovki Islands represent lies Mount Sikirny, and on top of it the Church of the Lord's Ascension, a place the prisoners call the Hill of the Axe, it is turned into a disciplinary isolation chamber where executions are carried out. The victims are attached to a heavy weight and thrown off the top of a 375-step staircase. The watchmen are usually former criminals and display unrestricted violence. Women represent about 10% of the prisoners, but their fate is particularly awful. In a world without any rights, they are but sexual slaves for the prison guards. As the months go by, new inmates keep coming to the Solovki Islands. There were around 200 in 1923, but three years later, as the repression against anyone not fitting the Bolshevik model hardens, there are almost 20,000. The dictatorship started right after Lenin's companions took power in October 1917. The Bolsheviks are a minority in such a huge country, and so they begin early on to use violence and coercion to strengthen their domination. Lenin believes 
believes that power can't be shared. The repression is based on the conviction that the new regime has the right to remove mercilessly all its opponents, called enemies of the people. In order to implement such terror, the Bolshevik government created in December 1917 the Cheka. The Cheka, which means extraordinary commission, is the party's sword and shield and exists and acts beyond the law. Lenin places Felix Dzerzhinsky as the head of the Cheka. He's 40 years old and has spent 11 years in prison or exiled. Among all of us, Felix has spent the most time in the Tsarist prisons. He knows his job. That was Lenin's comment to justify his choice. Felix Tsejinsky has the full support of Lenin, and in less than a year he puts together an incredible repressive machinery above all laws, and sometimes even above the party. It's a state within the state, with its own network of informers, special troops and intelligence services. In short, a political police of more than 200,000 people. Following an attack against Lenin on the 30th of August 1918 by an anarchist, Zedzinski sets off the repression. The Cheka is in charge of implementing the Red Terror. The number of victims of the Red Terror of autumn 1918 is estimated to be between 10,000 and 15,000 people. During the summer of 1918, the first concentration camps called Konslager, a name derived from German, are created. They are here to protect the Soviet Republic against its so-called enemies. The concentration camps are managed by the Cheka and gather people that have been arbitrarily arrested because they belong to a category the regime didn't like. Upper class, nobles, social dangerous elements. Along with these camps targeting political opponents, the Bolshevik regime is experimenting with corrective labor camps, camps that gather people sentenced by a court, usually for ordinary crimes. Corrective labor camps were intended to replace jail by re-education through labor. But the border between concentration camp and labor camp remains blurry, Many camps gather both political opponents, locked up without a trial, and sentenced criminals. In the autumn of 1921, there are 120,000 prisoners in about 200 camps. However, the number of opponents and malcontents keeps growing. In 1922, the Revolutionary Socialist Party, at once brother and rival of the Bolsheviks, is eliminated. Its leaders are pilloried during a spectacular trial and presented as traitors. Eight of them are sentenced to death, but the reactions of the international community commute the sentence. <laughs> Clergymen also fall victim to the repression. In spring 1922, the campaign of seizure of everything that belongs to the church leads to the arrest of thousands of priests and monks. Several major public trials of clergymen are held in Moscow and Petrograd, Hundreds of them are sentenced to capital punishment. Thousands are deported to camps. Choosing a monastery
industry as the location of the testing lab for a Soviet concentration camp-like system is not a random choice. In the middle of the 1920s, the Bolsheviks wanted Solovki Island to become a model of re-education through labor. The OGPU, the new name of the Cheka, assigns to the camp an ambitious plan of exploitation of both the forests and peat deposits. The new internal rules plan for 12-hour workdays, one day of rest every 10 days, and high rates of felling. Oleg Volkov refused to become an informer of the GPU. He was sentenced to just three years in a camp, but ended up spending 27 years there, a major part of it in Solovki. The jail regime was very strict, especially in the logging. Those who hadn't completed their task could be shot. That's what happened if you didn't respect the quotas. A former prisoner, Neftali Frankel, becomes head of the economy, his motto, we must put maximum pressure on a prisoner during their first three months. After that, they're useless. Frankel decides that the food ration will be proportional to the amount of work done. This practice will be at the core of the whole Soviet concentration camp system. The life and working conditions in Solovki become harsher and harsher, especially during winter when the temperatures drop. Later on, I saw with my own two eyes people being brought outside in their underwear, whereas everything was frozen. They'd been locked in an empty hangar. I myself had to spend the winter in a cell that wasn't heated. A Georgian officer who had managed to escape Solovki publishes in London in 1926 a book that narrates the atrocious living conditions in the camp. The same information is then published in 1927 by a French jurist named Raymond Duguay in his book A Prison in Red Russia, Solovki, the first book in French dealing with the camps in the USSR. Almost from its birth, the Gulag is known and denounced in the West. The Soviet government answers in 1928 by ordering from the OGPU a movie about Solovki in order to show that this hell is actually heaven. A cinema team comes to Moscow to film a nice summer camp. Cute white tablecloths, smoking rooms, games of chess, bathing. Even some shows with music. The guided tour of Solovki of the then popular author Maxim Gorky in 1929 also aims at falsifying information and hiding the true horror of the camp. We suspected he had come to Solovki for a purpose. 
to write that nothing horrible was happening there. In exchange, he had been promised that the living conditions of the prisoners would soften. Before he arrived, every patient in the hospital had been removed and the bed sheets had been replaced by clean ones. When he came in the hospital and saw the nurses with their white uniforms, he said, I'm quoting with absolute precision, I don't like theater. And he left. He didn't visit the patients. When he reached Mount Sikirni, the place where the worst was taking place, with the dungeons and where people were tortured, he found a table with newspapers on it. The inmates in that cell were supposed to read the newspapers to show that they were being re-educated. However, they held the newspapers upside down on purpose. Gorky realized it, put one of the newspapers back correctly and then left, showing that he had understood the message. Despite some reluctance, the author ends up writing a long article showing the benefits of Solovki. Camps such as Solovki are necessary. It is through them that the state will quickly reach one of its goals, putting an end to prisons. Gorky supports the system and sings The Birth of a New Man, Regenerated Through Labour. Four months after the visit of Maxim Gorky, the camp's leaders order the most extensive mass execution in the camp up till that point. They were shot in the neck. There were 300 shots more, perhaps. I think there was only one bullet per person. They couldn't aim well enough to kill with one shot and would just throw the bodies in a pit. The day following the executions, there were still people moving in the pit. 